chwarir. Na rda në qele mana, acquired mandibular defects. The most common cause for partial mandibular loss is surgical removal of an implant. The tumor may have become within the mandible or it may be in close or direct opposition to the mandible. The most common intraoral sites for squamous cell carcinoma are the lateral marsh of the tongue and the floor of the mouth. Both locations predispose the mandible to tumor invasion, often necessitating its resection in conjunction with large portion of the tongue, the floor of the mouth, and the regional lymphatics. Partial mandibular loss may also be seen secondary to trauma, congenital defects, and or osteoradionecrosis. The disabilities of a patient with acquired mandibular defect includes first, impaired speech articulation, second, difficulty in swallowing, third, problems with mastication, fourth, deviation of the mandible during function movements. Also, compromise control of the liver secretion, and finally, severe cosmetic disfigurement. Predisposing factors. The exact cause of oral cancer is unknown. Variation in the incidence rates among different groups or populations can be explained by difference in exposure to carcinogenic initiators or promoters. First, viruses. Many factors can cause cells to become malignant, but the role of viruses is being clearly examined. Dentures. Chronic irritation may be a cofactor in the formation of some oral cancers. Some squamous cell carcinomas appear to be an irritation from the procedure. In addition, some intraoral malignancies are found adjacent to ill-fitting removal processes. Alcohol. The risk of developing oral cancers is increased significantly in alcoholics. Tobacco. Heavy smoking also potentiates the risk of oral carcinoma. The association between tobacco products and oral malignancies include use of cigar, pipes, and chewing tobacco, as well as cigarettes. Leukoblechia. Leukoblechia is defined as any white patch on the oral mucous membrane that cannot be scrubbed off. It is asymptomatic and discovered during a routine dental examination. Various forms of tobacco usage may be a predisposing factor, however, leukoblechia may undergo malignant change. Oral like implants. Oral like implants is a disease of unknown etiology that affects the skin and oral mucous membrane. It appears as reticular plaque and erosive or combination. Like implants is considered a benign keratotic lesion without malignant potential. However, a small number of cases are associated with carcinomas. In these cases, periodic follow up is
classification of mandibular defects. The first classification is called Cantor and Curtis classification. Cantor and Curtis classified mandibular defects into six different categories based on the extent of the defect and the method of restoration. Class 1 is radical alveolectomy with the preservation of the mandibular continuity. That's to say, the inferior border of the mandible is still intact. Class 2 denotes lateral resection of the mandible distal to the cuspid area, distal to the canine tooth. Class 3 is the lateral resection of the mandible extending to the midline. Class 4 is lateral bone graft and surgical reconstruction of class 2 and class 3. Class 5 is the anterior bone graft and surgical reconstruction. Class 6 is anterior mandibular resection without surgical reconstruction. That's to say, class 5 is anterior mandibular resection with surgical reconstruction, while class 6 is anterior mandibular resection without surgical reconstruction. Second classification categorizes partial mandibular defects into two main groups. Group 1 marginal resection or what we call continuity defects group 2 is segmental resection or what we call discontinuity defects marginal resection is a simple marginal resection in which the mandibular continuity is retained as it involves a superior resection of the alveolar or basal bone with the overlying soft tissues leaving the inferior bone in these cases, the muscles of mastication are usually intact, so the mandibular movement is not disrupted and the resulting disabilities are less severe. Problems associated with adverse section include First, loss of vertical ridge height and vestibular depth will cause a reduction in stability for tissue supported processes. Second, loss of load bearing tissues available for support of the process. Third, desert border tissues may be present, which limits the process's border extension for maximum retention, support, and stability. Type 2, which is segmental section, involves Complete resection of a segment of the mandible from the alveolar test to the inferior border of the mandible, thus discontinuing. In these cases, the deviation of the mandible occurs towards the resected side and the mandibular occlusal plane is rotated in field. It is easily resolved, however, with mandibular guidance surgery, which we will discuss later on. I have to say again, the deviation occurs towards the resected site. This occurs due to contraction of the lateral trigoid on the intact side, while it's not present on the defect side. This causes deviation of the mandible towards the resected site. How to manage mandibular deviation? Three methods are available for management of mandibular division. First, intermaxillary fixation. Second, physiotherapy. Third, mandibular guided prosthesis, which is the most important fact. Intermaxillary fixation is an approach used in the past to reduce the deviation associated with resection of the mandible, but 
scant, currently not in field. It was to place the patient into intermaxillary fixation immediately using arch bars and elastics. This intermaxillary fixation is maintained for 5 to 7 weeks following surgery. Second method is physiotherapy. Following maximum opening, the mandible is manipulated by grasping the chin and moving the mandible away from the surgical site. These movements tend to loosen the scar contracture, reduce stress mass, and improve maxillomandible relationships. The best way to manage these cases is to use mandibular guidance procedure. The earlier the mandibular guidance process therapy is initiated, the more successful is the result. If the patient has undergone an extensive resection, or a considerable period of time has elapsed since the surgical procedure. Guidance procedures are much more difficult and a compromise occurs the relationship. The presence of teeth is an important requirement for construction of guidance processes. That's to say, if the teeth are not present, guidance is not effective. The excessive lateral forces generated during guidance of the mandible or serve to dislodge complete tension. Two types are available for construction of guidance processes. Lower mandibular guidance processes, which we usually call it buccal training flange, which is different from the buccal retaining flange of maxillary processes. Second is upper mandibular guidance processes, which is also called palatal ram. The buccal retaining flange is indicated when the mandible can be manipulated into an acceptable maxillomandibular relationship, but the patient lacks the motor control to bring the mandible into occlusion. The mandibular guidance processes consists of a remote partial denture, from work with a metal flange extending 7 to 10 millimeters laterally and superior laterally and superiorly on the buccal aspect of the bicuspids and the molars on the non-defect side on the non-defect side during closure the flange engages the maxillary teeth during mandibular closure, thereby directing the mandible into appropriate interocclusal position. The guiding flange may be constructed of cast chrome cobalt metal or acrylic resin reinforced with metallic mesh work like the previous slide. Most methods are Leucoblichia. Leucoblichia is defined as any white patch on the oral mucous membrane that cannot be scrubbed off. It is asymptomatic and discovered during a routine dental examination. Various forms of tobacco usage may be a predisposing factor, however, leucoblichia may undergo malignant changes. The palatal ramp is a maxillary process, which is usually constructed with acrylic resin, with either cast or wrought wire retainers, since it serves only on an interim basis until an acceptable occlusion can be established. Also, the mandible is manipulated laterally towards the desired position, and the occlusal contact with the palatal process is established in a pre acrylic resin index in the palate. The patient should be able to close into the index using appropriate manual manipulation of the mandible. The index should not extend much below 
the level of the anxieties because if it does it may interfere with the speech and the utilization. Prosthetic rehabilitation of mandibular communication. First, surgical consideration. Soft tissues are usually used to reconstruct marginal mandibular extremities. Skin graft, local flaps, pedicle flap, or microvascular free flaps can also be used for reconstruction of continuity defect. These procedures are done to establish proper support for the prosthesis later on. As we said, we have two types of medieval effects marginal resection and segmental resection. In the management of the other type of mandibular defects, which is the segmental mandibular defects, the two remaining mandibular segments can be carried out as follows. Either without the use of a reconstruction plate or with the use of a reconstruction plate to connect the two remaining mandibular segments or we use a reconstruction plate in addition to bone grafting, which is the best way to manage. Vascularized osseous free tissue transfer is a state-of-the-art form of mandibular reconstruction with long-term, excellent, functional and aesthetic outcomes. There are four donor sites for vascularized bone and soft tissue grafts for reconstruction. The iliac crest, the radial forearm, the scapula, and the fibula. The free fibula osseocutaneous flame can be considered the most versatile and reliable option for microsurgical reconstruction of large mandibular defects. The fibula has many advantages. First, bone length and thickness. Second, the flap can be harvested simultaneously with tumor resection, that's to say at the same time. Third, minimal donor site morbidity. And fourth, bone height which is suitable for an implant based restoration. Then, after reconstruction, the prosthetic considerations include either conventional remote partial denture, implant retained prosthesis, in which implants are either placed in the remaining bony segment in case of marginal resection or in the bone graft placed to restore continuity. In conventional remote partial dentures, the design will follow the usual principles of partial denture design and fabrication which apply to discontinuity defects. That's to say, major connectors should be rigid, where the rest must direct forces along the long axis of the teeth. Grinding planes should be employed to enhance stability and the bracing. Retention must be within the limits of physiological tolerance of the periodontal ligament. Maximum support should be gained from the adjacent soft tissues. In these cases, as we have only two remaining teeth, we can use double acre clasps with double retention and double bracing. That's to say the retention is in both the buccal and lingual sides from the tip and the bracing is taken from the rest of the arm from the buccal and lingual sides. Second, loss of load peeling tissues available for support of the process. Third, desert border tissues may be present, which limits the process's border extension for maximum retention so to preserve this teeth. In implant retained or implant supported processes, implants are either placed in the remaining bony segments in case of marginal resection or in the bone graft please to restore this thank you so much